Thank you, Harry, for the kind words. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been attending AI Helsinki for a few times already, listening to the excellent talks, and uh, I'm honored to be here talking myself today. Um, so the topic will be about card targeting in Clash Royale. Uh, yes, let's go right in. So I'm from Supercell. Uh, there's something about the company and the data asset that we have. Uh, we have four games uh, globally uh, available. Uh, there are the four characters on the pedestal. Uh, and then we have one game in beta also at the moment. Uh, five live games, and then we have a huge history of killed games uh, that you can see on the bottom. So, um, uh, one of the principles or philosophies of Supercell is that uh, we want to keep remain small, but still think big. So, one of the uh, fallouts from that is that uh, we have to be focused quite uh, clearly in what we do and what we want to do. So, in terms of games, that means that we want to focus on the good games and kill the bad games as soon as possible. And we have been doing that already uh, for uh, a dozen times. Uh, we have 100 million daily active users, so people who log in every day. So today we have uh, 100 million players and tomorrow again. And uh, that brings us to the data asset. Uh, so as Harry mentioned, we have three terabytes of compressed uh, data uh, coming in every day. and. Um, well, it's not just the raw data that matters. It's actually pretty difficult to process three terabytes of data and then like taking two days or one week. It's, it'll be like accumulating fast. So we, over the course of uh, the last, last years, we have built a data warehouse um, to store this data in a reasonable format. Uh, this has been built mostly for the game analytics needs. So uh, we have a structure where the game is uh, designed based with game designers but then we are tracking, like following how the game is doing, like how people are enjoying playing it and how often they are returning to the game afterwards and like at which stages of the game they are not returning anymore and so on. So for this kind of uh, ad hoc analysis, we have built the machinery to uh, operate on the data or like query the data. So it's like a, we have a game team who comes up with a dozen different questions every day and the data scientist uh, in the game team that I still also am. Uh, his job is to find out answers to all these questions every day, and the questions from, can vary from range to range. Yeah, so uh, about my background, I forgot to introduce myself. So, uh, Jaron Seppanen, um, I'm in Supercell uh, for four years now, uh, mainly as a game team data scientist, first in the Boom Beach game and now in Clash Royale. And lately we realized that we have a lot to uh, uh, give in terms of machine learning as well, and there's some um, lead applications already live, uh, one of which I will describe today to you. So we uh, decided to invest in more in machine learning and like found an actual team to get to do that uh, like full time. So that's what I'm shifting my focus into. Uh, and then coming back to the data warehouse, so it's not a data warehouse just for game analytics or ad, ad hoc analysis, but it's actually a bit like uh, accidentally, it's a very solid foundation for machine learning. So we have this bunch of data, but it's not just raw files on disk somewhere. It's actually organized and cataloged. So we have everything like queryable uh, and like fast access time. So you can like think about feature extraction. If you want to extract some feature about whatever, like how many battles pe people are playing, the players are playing. It's just a matter of querying that. And like if you want to query Clash Royale, you where Clash Royale with uh, like a where condition. If you want to qu query Clash of Clans, it's just a change in the SQL. So everything is in the same place, uh, queryable through SQL. That's very uh, good kickstart for machine learning. Um, then about very briefly about Clash Royale. It's a new game that's been out for like one and a half years now. A real-time player versus player battling game. Uh, so one-on-one -on -one and recently also two versus two modes where players play against other players like over the network in real time. So we have two players anywhere in the world and they can battle each other in Clash Royale. And it's a, it was quite a, a, a unique game when it came out. It was, it's kind of a genre-defining gameplay for mobile. So there hasn't been 
there hasn't been a game before Clash Royale that did what Clash Royale was doing and is doing. Um, and then the other aspect of it is that uh, it has a mechanism of card collection built in as well. Uh, so you don't only battle other players globally, but then uh, the player progression is like uh, collecting cards. So you have a, a collection of cards, you are getting them from uh, the game, from different places in the game, and like uh, accumulating your personal card collection over time. And like all the other Superstar games, it's also free to play, so you don't have to pay upfront. You can just install and start playing, and uh, the majority, large, large majority of our players are uh, ha enjoying it freely without paying. Um, then how this ties into machine learning is that um, we have been developing this uh, so-called live ops or live operations capability uh, in the game teams for a year already now, which is um, part of the game where um, we want to be able to make the games more dynamic. Yeah, it used to be so that uh, the game team develops an update for one month or two months or three months, and almost nothing happens during these three months. And then when the uh, game team is finished with the project or the sprint, we su submit that to Apple and Google, and they accept it and put it to the App Store, and then the players are able to download the new version. And then there's like a million improvements in that single day that they update their game. And then again, one to three months, uh, pretty much nothing happens again. So live ops is a um, uh, uh, philosophy or like approach to making the games more dynamic in between updates, in between the releases of the game, that uh, the game is actually built to have a dynamic uh, content so that the game itself is just like a, some kind of a shell where we can then upload new images and new parameters uh, from the servers in between the game releases. So we can, for example, uh, the game team can decide today that we want to do a new kind of event in the game. Uh, a challenge or whatever that we think is a good idea to put live, then we can just create, uh, draw the graphics that we want to put in the game, uh, fix the parameters of the event, how many days it will last, how, which, how, which players are eligible to uh, participate and so on, and then put it live, and we can have it live in like a five minutes like lag, so it's really more like an internet age way of uh, operating games. Um, but there lies also um, a challenge for us. So we, as we want to be a small company and we really don't want to have huge teams, for example, also uh, the content creation requires a lot of work, like de designing the events, scheduling them, when to have an event and how are they, uh, how are they composed, which event follows which event and like what are the players getting from the events and so on. That requires a lot of work and uh, the market is developing more towards these kind of dynamic games or live ops, live operated games. So it's kind of a standard to be competitive that you have to have a, like a dynamic and fresh game every day. There's like a huge requirement for the team size to, to have this content creation happening. So what we are, uh, our vision is to be able to help, like think differently in terms of how we can achieve the live operations with small teams. And machine learning is quite a natural uh, tool to use for that purpose. So we would like to automate a large fraction of the uh, uh, live ops content, or like the daily variation in the game, uh, the day-to-day -day events, and then spare the time of our like game designers and the live ops experts on the high-profile things that happen maybe like once a month or so, like more rarely, but, but much bigger visibility, much bigger uh, impact. And then just having the like daily grind done by machines, ideally. That's the vision. Uh, what we actually did, and what's uh, even live as of now in the game, is uh, this thing called card targeting. So uh, this, is the w this ties into the card collection aspect of Clash Royale. So we have these cards in the game, uh, almost 80 uh, cards in total in the whole game as of now. And players have their personal card collections. They some players tend to like to play with different kinds of cards. This is actually a screenshot from my own game. I like to play with three musketeers. That's a fun card, in my opinion. So, uh, but somebody else might want to play Hog Rider. It's a different playing style, different 
kind of aggression versus defense, kind of different kind of a feeling to playing with the different cards and people have different opinions and they'd like to, that's kind of one of the fun factors of the game that you can play it differently. It's the same game but different game because you want, are playing with your own cards and you are collecting the cards yourself. So uh, and we have these kind of special offers here on top you can see this three musketeers chest is a special offer. It only appears like rarely in the game so normally you don't see that at all and it's just see this part that starts from cards, and that's like the normal shop in the game. So we have special offers, that's kind of a, uh, this kind of dynamic content that I mentioned. And uh, we had like a simple goal. Let's sell cards that the players want to buy. Like try to make special offers to players that uh, are meaningful to the players. And like, but still it's a different card for every player, but maybe we can figure out which card we need to offer to which player to, be, to make it meaningful for that player. Uh, that's kind of a very simple goal. Uh, then the details start to emerge. Uh, it's not just about the end goal anymore. Uh, what's the pricing but that we would, should use for the cards or for the chests? Uh, what kind of stack sizes should we offer? For example, here you can see the pricing is 490 gems. The stack size is 26 cards in this uh, example offer. Um, then there's some details about when you want to offer the, make the offer. Uh, it makes sense from the gameplay, game economics-wise and the playing style-wise. It makes sense to offer only at some point when you are kind of when you get the most benefit. If you buy this, that you are actually getting an upgrade to your card. If you buy this uh, at the wrong time, it doesn't change your game at all. So you just buy it, and you get a number that increases. But maybe like a week later, you're at that point in your game that it makes sense to buy, and you will get a level up, and you will get a win your opponents, and you get get like a uh, change in your gameplay by buying that offer. Uh, then other aspects is that you can the play cards that you are using in your in your game, we should be uh, maybe offering those cards to you like. Does it matter how much does it matter that if you are using a card in your deck, how important is that in deciding which card to show here? And the deck has eight cards. Which of the eight, if you are using a deck that has eight cards, which out of the eight cards should be used? That's kind of a detail also in the targeting. Or then other features might be that you are requesting cards. There's a mechanism called clans in the game. Uh, clans are uh, people playing together. They have joined the same clan and they can. Uh, request cards from each other and donate cards, like exchange cards in the clan. So you might actually request a card from the clan, like actively request it. I want somebody to donate to me uh, three musketeers because I want to play with that. That's a potentially a very good signal for uh, the targeting. But these are all the details that we then have to solve when going for this. Uh, so more concretely, what's the problem statement? What are we trying to do. Um, so provide dynamic content that the players find interesting. So it should not be just random content or any other content, but just something that the players want to buy. And how do we define interesting? Well, let's just look at the purchase rate. So if we uh, make 100 offers, what percentage of those 100 offers did the players buy? Because it's kind of like voting with your feet. If you uh, decide to buy, it's kind of a positive vote. And if you decide to ignore, it's a negative vote. So we assume that the purchase rate is a good proxy for interestingness or fun. But then it also should react to the changes in playing style. So people are changing their playing style. That's uh, the fun thing in the game that you can change the decks and stuff. So actually the features should be time dependent or changing as you change the game. Uh, also not too spammy. So you don't want to offer like desperately all the time, whenever we can. But ideally, so we took this as a kind of design principle from the day one that the model should be able to decline an offer if the model thinks that the player will not buy it. So there's kind of filtering happening. We have a model that predicts what, what offers are good for this player, or is there any of the offers that the player would want to find good. So there's kind of a no offer case also included. And finally, also without breaking the game or the game economy. Uh, so there's, I mean, 
players are getting these resources and they are playing other players, so there's kind of fairness between players is involved. And then feeding too much stuff too fast might kind of break the game even that we are like uh, flooding the gameplay with something. Uh, that the, like you will suddenly, if, we, if there's a bug in the system and we are like offering the same card to everybody and people are playing a lot of that card, that will actually show up in the gameplay because more people will play with that card then and then it's kind of the game becomes more boring if we are just like uh, flooding the game with just a single card. So we have hand-designed cooldowns for the system. So uh, the model can only make an offer once per two weeks for a player. So if you buy something, or if you don't, if you don't buy, you will see an offer, but that it'll, be, it'll be a two-week cooldown before you will see anything to be like balancing the uh, interestingness, but also pre- pre- uh, preventing flooding the game. Then a kind of a sketch of the solution. Uh, what we need to do first is create an inventory of content. This is like a, the idea behind the machine learning for live ops is that the humans design the inventory. It's like a shop that we put the things on the shelf and then the machine can pick which thing to offer to which player from the shelf. But the shelf is fixed or the inventory is fixed. So on the left you see uh, from the game, so there's some graphic, as- graphic assets. Uh, which show different cards. We have 21 cards uh, that we are offering to players. Uh, they all have their graphics and their like the texts that we are showing to players. That's like the inventory. Then we do some feature extraction, which things... I mean, here's some... Uh, here's some hints to what things might be relevant for features. Uh, so we create feature extractors for these things. Then the third part is a bit tricky. We need some labels. But the idea to run machine learning, you have to have features and labels, and then you run logistic regression, and then you're done. Uh, well, we have to deploy that to the game, but that's like the, like the template of machine learning. But the third point is a bit difficult, because we don't have the offers. I mean, when starting out, we didn't have any of these offers in the game. We had no labels. Nobody had bought a single one of these uh, when we came up with the idea even though we have three, three terabytes of data, but we didn't have the correct data for this particular uh, feature. Uh, then what we did, um, so we're already on the third iteration. Uh, first iteration was done in June. We had a bit of an, maybe a bit of naive thinking that, well, if you don't have labels, then it's good to do random exploration. Uh, just put out random offers to people and then figure out which ones they want to buy out of random ones. And then you have labels, and that's like that's an easy way to get labels. But that failed quite miserably. Um, people, it, we learned that people don't like totally random offers because they like take them very personally because it's your game. You have a special offer f- just for you, and it's got some kind of crap card. Like, and also like randomly, one out of eighty is going to be guaranteed to be like a crap card for all the players all the time. So that. We didn't have that live for very long. Um, and then we took learnings from that and um, decided that we need to do something more intelligent instead of totally random exploration. So that's the version two. We still didn't have any labels. We had the random exploration live for a very short time. We didn't get enough labels to start learning from those. So we figured out that we need some kind of bootstrap approach, that we use some other data that we already have that we can assume that will give us good uh, targetings in this feature. So the requested card was the dataset that we decided to use. So players are requesting cards from their uh, colleagues or their friends in the clan. That's a pretty good signal of if you're requesting a card, you are interested in that and you might want to uh, buy the offer as well. So we chose to take that as a bootstrap model that we're just trying to predict which cards the players are requesting. And when we have that model working, then let's, let's repurpose that model for making offers as well. And there's the assumption that uh, the cards that you are requesting are like uh, working well as an offer, which is also not guaranteed. There's some problems with there as well, but we thought it's good enough that we can put it live. And we did, and it worked out in September. So this version 2 has been live uh, uh, on and off, but now for two months already. Or, yeah, two months, roughly. And then, actually, just 
this week uh, I put live the version 3, which is only now it's like the actual uh, clean machine learning tasks that we have the labels from the actual task that we are doing. So now we have labels finally from the purchases that we we have we have had uh, offers live in the game. Uh, players have been buying them and not, and then we have the labels from the purchases. So now we have finally the data set that we wanted. We have the task and we have data to solve that task, and so we're kind of good. And that's like the version 3 that we call. But one of the messages here is that uh, I think it's very good because what we figured out already from the version 1, we learned a ton from version 1, even when we didn't have any machine learning model, about how to represent the offers to the players. There was a kind of a, there were many mistakes in the version 1. The random exploration was one of them, but what failed ultimately was the player perception or the player experience. We didn't do at all a good thing, good good job with the player experience, so we learned how should we structure these kind of dynamic offers. Whether there is machine learning or not even. We just learned about the problem domain already in June, and then with the second iteration we were already bet much better with a, like a good, like an okay model. The, okay, the model was still not from the actual data set, but it was like okay bootstrap model, and then we had a better representation, better, better experience. So we were already better like learning fast and moving fast and improving the game for the players. So the take home message from this slide is that it's very good to do things fast. So like uh, as the saying goes, done is better than perfect. So you don't have to have a perfect model, you have to have the model live and then get some uh, learnings out of the model to be able to improve the, the next version. Then just like the tech slide here, uh, what are we actually doing? Uh, so the task is again, would player X buy the card Y if offered as a special offer? So it's quite simply binary logistic regression that we are doing. We have 21 cards, so it's like 21 binary problems. If we offered the first card to this player, would the player want to buy it or not? It's a binary outcome. So we have binary logistic regression. Um, we have uh, an okay amount of features, 3,800 input features. Uh, they are on the right. I can go through them in a minute. And 21 binary targets, which are the offers. Uh, and then they're, they're including the no offer case. So we can also decide that the player doesn't want any of these 21 cards. Let's not offer any of these to him or her. And I was prepared to... Uh, Praise the logistic regression here that we are doing that, and we have been doing that so far until just this week. We actually went live with a two layer, uh, multi layer perceptron. So we're actually doing deep learning kind of in, in live. Uh, to my own surprise, I was uh, quite boldly thinking that we only need the logistic regression, just linear model. But we uh, were evaluating these. We had a two versions the uh, simple version without the hidden layers, and then the version in live has 100 hidden nodes in the hidden layer. And we saw in the offline, we did some offline evaluation before launching in live that it actually was improving the metrics, uh, like the uh, area under the rock curve, for example, or precision and those things. So it was an uh, improvement, improvement in the offline evaluation. So we decided that we want to put it, uh, start testing it in live to see if it's an actual improvement in the game. Uh, then the features, so we have 300, 800 in total. They are split into four kind of uh, parts, four buckets. First of all, the card collection, so which cards the players have. Uh, what, what are the cards in your personal collection, your and your and your. Uh, so the card levels in your collection, and then how many cards are you missing from the next level. This was the thing that I was talking about, that it doesn't make sense to offer at any point in time, but it makes, to off make, it makes sense to offer at a specific time when you're close to upgrading your card. There's a feature for that, and then some cross features. This 2,200 is like a, just cross features of the cards in the collections, the levels of the cards in the collections, and the number of cards missing from the next upgrade in your collection, and so on. Uh, then the cards used in battle. So out of the collection, you might have a 70-card collection, but then you always choose eight cards into the deck that you go to battle with, and that's a quite a strong signal that these are the cards that I want to like use. That's a very strong, strong signal. So that's a very uh, 
straightforward thing the users feature as well. Uh, which cards did you use in the battle? And likewise, which card did you, did you not use in the battle? So you might have, like, people are also unlocking cards. So not everybody has access to the same cards. So it's like a, it's a positive signal if you take a card to battle, a negative signal if you, like, neglect a card. Don't bring a card to battle. That's like both sides are represented in those features. And then also we have different times, time spans. Just like one day into the past, like yesterday, or seven days into the past, or 30 days into the past, like capturing some of the time variance. That's 1,000 features. Uh, then the cards requested from clan. That's another one. So the signal is that if you are requesting a card from the clan, that's a very positive thing. Positive signal for that card. And then again, that you are not requesting some other card. It's a negative signal. Uh, there are 500 features, and also like yesterday, last week, last month, time spans. And cross features, making it up to 500. And then account features as well. XP levels and arena levels of the players. That's 30 features. And one like hypothesis why the, why the, like, the multi-layer perceptron is actually improving things is that we don't have cross features across these kind of top level features. We only have cross features inside each bucket here. But let's say the account features is really potentially useful as a cross. So cross from account features to uh, cards used in battle, for example, is very interesting. It's just that you are a player that has progressed very far and you are using these cards in battle. That's like a cross feature that we don't have in the features, but the multi-layer perception is able to learn from the data if it finds that in, uh, important. That's my hypo hypothesis why that helps. Then we go to the technology, technology stack, what we are doing to make this happen in the game. There's um, like a three-part life cycle into the, this machine learning product or the machine learning feature. Uh, first, we collect the data uh, out of the game. Then we have to train a model that happens offline. So we have data uh, and label, features and labels. Well, we extract the features uh, and extract the labels, and then we train the model on the, on the data and validate if it's like working in some sense. We have some proxy measure of how well the model is working, like accuracy, for example, and evaluate it offline to see if it makes sense to consider going live with this. And then when we're happy in the offline phase, so Step number two is like an iteration. We iterate with the model, and then when we're happy, we go live with the model. And it has a separate stage of feature extraction again, and model inference, and then deployment. Because we have to run the model again today, and tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow. So we have to have feature extraction, because that's like the yesterday's features were part of the feature set. So we have to compute today's features for tomorrow's uh, like deployment. So that's why we need feature extraction in live. Uh, again and again. And then, yeah, model inference and deployment finally to the actual game. So we have the, uh, uh, the predictions in a file, and then we want to get the predictions visible to the players. Uh, the components we are using, there's a mix, that's kind of an alphabet soup. I'm not going to read through it. It's like maybe a teaser if somebody knows about these technologies that what we are actually using. Um, there's a lot of Amazon in there, Kinesis, S3, EMR, they're all Amazon uh, web technologies that we are using. That's kind of a, our de facto provider. Um, some other things to highlight. Um, we have a different solution for the f um, feature extraction and the modeling. So the feature extraction is done in parallel using Spark. That's a parallel data processing library that runs on tens of servers, and it handles the parallelization and whatnot, like MapReduce and all that things. But then we are actually training the model just on a single EC2 server. It's even a single process, so it's like not parallelized at all. We do all the hard, hard feature extraction into a file, then we copy the file to a like Linux box, and then we just run PyTorch on that file to train the model on a single process on like a relatively modest scale. So it's like doesn't require any kind of fancy parallelization and stuff. And then when, we, when the model is done, we have to wait for like a few hours. We copy the file, copy the model back to the 
uh, Spark cluster, and then we apply the model or do the inference in uh, we embedded uh, PyTorch inside Spark to do the uh, inference in Spark again, like to scale out to all the players that we have. Yes. Then some learnings as well. So the real world is dirty, even if it's a virtual real world. Uh, so well, we have to begin with, we have a daily batch run. So ideally, you would like to update the player experience. Like you play a match and you change your deck. That ideally might change your recommendations, if we call them such. But we are far from that. We are actually having daily batch, batch runs. We run the features daily, run the deployment daily, and it stays in the game for one day because of like technical simplicity reasons. Uh, it's for currently we don't have the tech or the like the patience to build the stack to run these things in real time. So we are running them just daily in a batch. This comes back to the thing that it's better to have it done than perfect. So we consider this better than a real-time thing that doesn't yet exist. And the data is highly imbalanced. So this is a free-to-play game. Uh, there's only a small fraction of players that want to pay money in the game. And similarly here, there's a small fraction of players who want to buy the uh, offers, even no matter how relevant they are. If it's like the maximum relevance, they're still not going to buy it. So we're gonna, getting a really few like uh, positive labels, and most of them are negative. So how to deal with that? Uh, that's kind of a practical thing. And then also we don't have, like, it's not an isolated problem, these offers. They are part of the game, they're in a slot in the game, and there's stuff on the top and on the bottom and on the left and on the right of the offers that we are optimizing. So they are not in a sandbox. They are like part of the game, and if we change the offers somehow, it will affect the rest of the game. So like, if we have insanely good offers, then players aren't gonna. They are gonna. They're gonna have a lot of huge, like, big purchase rate, huge success from the offers. But then people won't buy any of the normal things that we have in the game. So they like eat away from the rest of the game around our offers. So, they, so the offers are part of the game, and we have to keep in mind what's the, like the big picture, or the whole picture of the game. Which brings us to the next point, uh, what's the actual end goal? What, or in, in terms of uh, analytics, what metrics are we optimizing? Let's say we want to machine learn the offers. So what's the loss? What's the end loss to optimize? Is it, and it should be like the fun of the player is somehow the real world thing that we want to optimize. Uh, or relevance, that the offers are relevant to the players. Uh, but what, what do we actually optimize to, to maximize relevance or maximize fun? And one uh, concrete note that we could also maximize uh, revenue, like money coming in, but that's a very short-term thing. We can maximize. We can use machine learning to maximize the revenue for a day or for a week, but we believe that that will be like uh, a long-term loss. We will like burn out the players, flood the game economy, like and then like ruin the game in the long term if we want to do that kind of optimization. So like we are very much thinking what's the thing to optimize for, and for the moment, the proxy is the purchase rate. Just by thinking that uh, the players vote by buying, so it's like a vote of trust. They want to buy that offer, they are voting that it's a good offer, and that's what we optimize for. And then considering that we are not doing too much of that, to not to eat away from the rest of the game, and maintaining an A-B test, that we're actually testing out things in a controlled fashion that we see if, it, if we are having a net total or net Total net net positive or net negative effect in the game. And also, when going live, there's no undo, we, as we noticed with the random exploration. So we can put stuff live, but it's, when it's out there, it's out there, and players are seeing it, and they are complaining, and it's like um, better to make your best bet still by testing the things and validating the things a lot, that you are like 99% sure that this works, and it does a reasonable thing, and then putting it live. Uh, uh, like not playing with the players' uh, feelings too lightly. Then, uh, like a obfuscated results page. So here's the purchase rate without the uh, dimensions. So, and we have three things here. These, these are not the versions one point one, two, and three that I showed, but it's like a slightly different thing. Uh, the first bar is the version one, so the random exploration. Uh, it has the worst purchase rate of the three. And then the, but the following two ones, this, this is the version two, 
Uh, this slide is like outdated because we just went live with the version 3 this week, so I don't have that here yet. Uh, and it, it's, my, it's actually currently looking like it's not even improving from here. So like the improvements from the uh, multi-layer perceptron were like offline, it was improving, but in the real game we haven't materialized the improvement yet. There's some things to improve there, but it's not an automatic win. Um, but the most imp interesting thing in this picture is the middle bar, which is like tells about the importance of the experience. So what's different between the first random and the second random is the presentation to the players. So we have a different presentation, pr different like enclosure where we present the targetings in the game. There are similar targetings. We just pick a card for a, for a player and then we put it in the game and the player sees it. But we changed, we learned from the first iteration that we had a bad, bad machine learning and we had bad, bad presentation. So we tried to fix both. And you can see here that if you, even if we do random exploration in the second version, this is random exploration, but in, a, in the improved presentation. It actually is better than the ra first random. And then if we have add machine learning on top of random, it's a smaller improvement. Uh, this is like the linear model. And it's a smaller improvement uh, than the first improvement, so just from changing the presentation. So it's like the message here is that it's uh, always you don't have to you mustn't think about the machine learning as like just a machine learning problem. But it's also like we're, but we're talking about the user experience, what the players are seeing, and what they are buying, and how they are like feeling about what they're buying. That's what matters in the end. Then next steps well, for us, uh, well, expanding, of course, like that this seems to be doing well. We want to have a bigger inventory, uh, like more cards. Uh, we have 21 now, but we have 80 cards in the game, so we could just expand to 80 cards. Uh, that's one thing that we could do. Uh, improve the features, find out how far can we go with the machine learning in this case, and then this so-called machine learning in the wild. So we are not training the model yet in the live daily loop. It's a fixed model that we train by hand, and then, then deploy that same model day by day. But uh, actually the player behavior changes over time, slowly but still, so we should actually retrain the model as well. So that's called machine learning in the wild. You have a model that gives out stuff to players, and the players react to that stuff, and it changes their playing style, and the labels change. So you should actually update the model again. It's kind of feedback loop between the machine learning model and the, uh, the users. Uh, that's called machine learning in the wild. Uh, then, of course, expanding to other games. We are only are talking about Clash Royale here. Uh, there's much interest in doing the same thing for all the games, or like re related things for all the games. And of also, other machine learning use cases. There's some examples that could be done. Spam filtering comes to mind. <laughs> there's somebody who's doing that. Um, search and recommendations, improving the relevance, also not in the, uh, in the shop, but elsewhere in the game. Uh, uh, yeah, actually, we have spam filtering. That's also another thing that we already did. It's not really live in the game. Uh, then there's this thing called LTV, or lifetime value, that we are do using to um, measure digital marketing. How, what's the marketing return on investment? Are we doing profit or loss when marketing digitally? That's an LTV model. That, uh, that's a machine learning model that we also did, and it's already live. Uh, game balancing is not the thing. How to make sure that the game is balanced and diverse, and that's a really difficult problem, and how to help that the game designer design the good balance for the game by keeping him informed. We don't want to say data-driven, because it's not, a, it's not a thing that we take the data and just change the, mo change the game to match the data. It's like a... It's a, it's an, it's a craft to balance the game, and we want just to provide Input, input to the data uh, game designer who is uh, designing the game. Both detection or churn prevention or content creation or other example use cases of machine learning. Uh, but yeah, I'm coming to the end of the talk. So conclusions, uh, the machine learning model itself is, let's say, 10% of the work. But it's like a small minority of the work. There's the software engineering part. There's the user experience design part like uh, uh, assessing the results and like seeing how it works and like all that. It's the majority of the work. 
And fast iteration is very important. That's how you get good results in the end. You don't get good results by uh, by like tweaking the model like for weeks and weeks, but rather trying out stuff, try, trying out things fast, and then learning from the experiments. Now, as we mentioned, the end user experience, which is the end goal that drives all of the game design. But still, we also learned that we need a good model to start with, uh, or some kind of. It ties in with the user experience. We need a model that we can believe that it's good enough, that works well enough, that its experience is good enough, that we can launch. And logistic regression is really good. It just works most of the time, uh, just like that. And then one thing in when being live is that it's pretty important to like have good bookkeeping of what has been live when that we put things to the game. We want to iterate fast, we make a lot of changes, like daily changes. Then if we come like look back like last week, or let's say if we look back into like uh, September when we had the first model live, and we like try to figure out what we what was actually live, what was the version, the model version, the software version, like the dependencies, the PyTorch version, like what did we actually put live? And then to be able to like handle all that history. It's very important to keep track of the live uh, results that you have put live. And then a uh, small note in the end, we are actually recruiting uh, for a data engineer. If, this, uh, fi if you find this interesting, uh, we are looking for people to join the machine learning team, so we don't want to have a one-person team uh, for very long. And if you are interested in like doing this stuff, like keeping the data and the models fresh for serving to our daily, daily uh, player base, that's what we are looking for somebody to do with us. Uh, so first of all, we are looking for a data engineer with a lot of experience with the data processing, like managing all this complexity of uh, running this thing in, in a real, real uh, product uh, and in a huge scale uh, in the cloud. Uh, in practice, using Python and Java. So Python is the machine learning stack, and Java is the stack that we are using to build the games. So that's like also a bit maybe unusual combination of skills. And then why would anybody want to do this? Well, we want to build games that our players love for tens of years. So that's like the vision of the company. We are here for the long term and not to optimize for the short term. There's a link where you can find it on the supercell.com uh, careers page as well, uh, if you are interested. That's all I had. Thank you. I wanted to ask, have you tried uh, consider or consider trying uh, random forests? Uh, yeah, I know they are good. I haven't tried myself. Um, yeah, maybe I'm not just used with, uh, like, I haven't used them personally, so it's like a bit of neglect on my part. But maybe the gains, like, as we noticed that the, the, the End user experience plays a huge role, even with random, uh, like label, r random predictions, random offerings. So I'm not like expecting that to be a magic, bu magic bullet as such that like it would change the game dramatically. But that's a very solid technology I've heard. Yeah, uh, maybe related. Uh, you mentioned the area under ROC. Yes. Do you remember the numbers? How much they changed? They were surprisingly high in 0.9. Uh, yeah, I'm suspecting a bug, but yeah, that's what, what they were. I was using a scikit-learn, so I didn't implement that myself, so I kind of have some trust to those numbers. So, um, how do you uh, introduce exploration in the data, so that like, you really get like, negative, negative samples, samples there? Good, and good question, yeah. We actually have that, so the, it's part of the software stack, so we are actually not just running one model at a time. We have an implementation where we can run many models and like take random subsets of the players and assign the players to the different models randomly. So all the time we have had a random model all the time as one of the models. So we have been collecting random data throughout the whole time that we are, it's like the, it's like, I think it's called, uh, it's called canary testing or whatever, but anyway that 
the large majority of players see like good offers and then you have a small set of players who and like it's not the players but the, the small chance that you will see a random uh, offer every time you see one and then we use those random we track those random which ones were random like we have to have the bookkeeping to know when we had a random offer and when we had a like a modeled offer and then use the random we're actually using the random data for offline validation so that's why how we decide which model is good before launching good question thank you